Open the eyes of my heart, Lord. Open the eyes of my heart, I want to see. I want to see you. See you, my lifted up, shining in the light of your glory. Pour out your power and love. As we sing, holy, holy, holy. A veni Dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow, judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So, growing up for me, um, I'm going to share a little bit about um, me growing up. My mom was a Jehovah's Witness, so I lived in a bubble, essentially. I went to church a lot. Uh, I didn't realize it, uh, but my dad didn't want to be involved. And the reason for that was he just kind of wanted my mom to do it everything, all the child uh, rearing for everything. So I, I didn't grow up with having, my father was there, but he was kind of only like, he was, he was the financial breadwinner. And uh, I realized later that he kind of liked it that way so he could just be home and drink, mm -hmm. essentially. So he used that opportunity to take the kids away so they could do whatever he wants. Um, and so I grew up in a very religious background and um, it wasn't until like I was until I told my mom that I was like I was like 16 or something. I'm like, you know what? I don't I don't want to do this anymore. 
And um, at that point, my mom pretty much stopped talking to me for a year. And um, that led me into like a huge, deep depression that did not end until until I met Jackie. And um, uh, for those of you who don't know us, um, my beautiful wife Jackie in the back. Hi, Jackie. Um, she met me in college. Yeah, Jackie. And um, <laughs> um, what, but what drew me from going to a very religious background and living in that bubble to coming to the church to the church here was really um, just the spirit in the people. I remember the first time I walked in, like like there's two or three dudes that came to me, want to study the Bible. I'm like, dude, I don't even know you. <laughs> you know what I mean? Dude, these guys came up to me and they hugged me and I'm like, again, I don't know you. <laughs> and so it felt like kind of awkward um, at first. Uh, I was really like just remembering how open and willing people are, are were to kind of just spend time with you, and I'm like, dude, I just know you. I studied the Bible with um, David Reinhardt, oh, yeah. Brandon Buckley, and uh, Matt Dickens. That's right. oh. I remember Gio going to a few of the studies too. It was pretty <laughs> funny. Um, whenever you saw us get together at the Barnes and Nobles or at the Starbucks, if he took a look at us. Yeah. I mean, Matt Matt was six seven neck tattoos. <laughs> Brandon Buckalo came in with his motorcycle and with his like uh, face mask of a skull. <laughs> and David David Reinhardt had like these dreads like all the way to his shoulder. Yeah. And then there was me. I mean, <laughs> I mean, Jackie would tell you that her first impression of me is that I, I she thought I was a homie. Yeah. <laughs> so um, you got the, you have those guys get together. We look like the, you know, the church gang <laughs> conference or something, you know. Um, but what was beautiful to me about that is that God does not look at our appearance, mm -hmm. our clothing, or anything else. He accepts us for who we are. And I think that was one of the other things that kind of touched me was that you have these dudes you know, bikers for Christ kind of thing, you know? <laughs> and um, guys were open and honest. And I'm not, I wasn't used to that. You know, like I grew up, if you have any feelings, talk to your mom about it. And so like that was something completely new and different for me um, that I was exposed of uh, when I, that, that I was exposed of when I started coming to church. I will go back to the scripture here in Hebrews um, I'll reread it again. It says, For the word of God is alive and active, mm -hmm. sharper than any double edged sword. It penetrates even the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. So, going back to that scripture, I remember reading the scripture during the studies, and it just, I mean, mind you, I grew up going to church. So, all these ideas about God and religion and whatever, this is not new to me. But I think what was new to me was the active part. Mm -hmm. And I realized for the first time that when you, when you get baptized and you receive the Holy Spirit inside of you, that little part of you that tells you, go encourage someone, mm -hmm. go to pray with someone, uh, go do whatever, um, give your tithe, contribution, whatever. Like that was what I was able to see in people that I did not see growing up. And that to me made a huge difference because it was the difference between having a relationship with God and just doing things because that's what you're told to do. Mm -hmm. And um, it was very impactful for me for to be accepted for who I am rather than having that kind of unconditional and unconditional love. So like, I love you if you do all these other things. If you follow all these rules and regulations, then you are my son. Mm -hmm. That's what I grew up with. Mm -hmm. And now it's like, I love you regardless. Yeah. And if you choose to be with us, I love you regardless. Yeah. And um, that was really truly impactful for me. Mm -hmm. um, so I asked you guys as we, get ready to pray for communion, that you could kind of 
for those of you who are baptized, to think of that Holy Spirit that resides inside of you and ask yourself, what is it that God wants me to do? Is it pray for someone? Is it, um, is it spending time with someone? It could be as easy as a phone call. But the thing is, what I've realized is that if you don't act upon that Holy Spirit, that, that, that sound or God, God's dwelling inside of you, like that voice grows dimmer and dimmer over time. And the, the stronger relationship that you're going to have with God is the more, the more that you act upon that. Yeah. So I encourage you guys to do that as I pray for communion. Amen. Heavenly Father, I pray that as we take our, take our communion today, that we can reflect upon your word and how you speak to us. I pray that as a church, we can learn how to be led by your Holy Spirit. I also pray that we could recognize it when you speak to us and act upon it when we're able. Lord, I thank you for everything that you've given us. I pray this name, Son Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.
That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. I sought the Lord, and He heard, and He answered. That's why I trust Him. That's why I trust Him. I sought the Lord. Because the Pharisees had this mentality. 
of we're safe, mm. right? And it's a mentality that we can tend to get a lot as Christians. Yeah. Yeah. Of, I'm safe. Mm. I've made it. I've done the due diligence. I'm good. That's the mentality I get into. I'm safe. And when you get safe, you get complacent. Yeah. Yeah. Right? And John is like, no, 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 no. You guys are not producing good fruit. You are not proving repentance. And what's interesting about it is he compares these two things. A confession of sins versus what repentance is. And I think this is the thing I've always messed up. Confession helps bring forgiveness. But we prove repentance through our actions. One of the things I think I lost somewhere along the way is that I started to correlate confession to repentance. I started to think, if I confess, then I've repented. And it gets in this mentality of, I'm just comfortable admitting my wrongdoings, but I don't want to do anything about it. I think this is the biggest misconception of repentance is, if I am open, then I'm repenting. And don't get me wrong, that is good, but it is not great. Being better than bad does not mean you are good. It just means you're on the step of progress, right? And so it's easier for me now at this point in my walk to feel comfortable confessing. I'm like, you know what? I can admit when I screwed up. I can admit I made a mistake. I, I can be open. But the follow-through is the hard part, yeah. mm -hmm. right? And it's really interesting because Jesus brings us to light, much like John, in a very harsh way. And Jesus also here is talking to the Pharisees. And he says in verse 33, A tree is identified by its fruit, similar to John. If a tree is good... Its fruit will be good. If a tree is bad, its fruit will be bad. You brood of snakes, once again. How could an evil man like you speak what is good and right? For whatever is in your heart determines what you say. A good person produces good things from the treasury of a good heart. And an evil person produces evil things from the treasury of an evil heart. And I tell you this, you must give an account on judgment day for every idle word you speak. The words you say will either acquit you or condemn you. Once again, pretty harsh, stern language that Jesus uses here. Very similar to John. Doesn't contradict John. He even uses the same words. He's making this point that your actions show where your heart truly lies. Which makes sense. Like, when you think about repentance, if repentance was just confession, it'd be easy. Right? I could, I could do whatever I want, and I'd be like, all right, let me, let me talk to somebody, let me get open, let me come to my God and say, you know what, I'm sorry. No, I'll just do it again and again and again, because that's what I truly want. But what we see here is that what we do comes from a treasury of where we're at. Right? And so the, the introspective part I want you to think about today is, what is the most consistent sin you have to confess to somebody? What is the one that you constantly have to come back and get open over and over and over again? So my follow-up question is, are you truly trying to repent of that sin? Or are you just comfortable confessing? Or maybe even before that point, you're not even comfortable confessing it yet. Right? Because the actions are not what saves us, right? We saw that confession and being open and repenting, those things, right? Those are what saves us. But the actions show us where we're at. They show us what we're actually seeking after. They show us where our heart truly lies. And to continue into the other part of the Bible, into the more deeper in the New Testament, we see James. He talks a little bit about the heart here. He says, temptation comes from our own desires, which entice us and drag us away. These desires give birth to sinful actions, and when sin is allowed to grow, it gives birth to death. So don't be misled, my dear brothers and sisters. And that makes sense. That was the same thing Jesus was saying, is where your heart lies, then your actions will show it. And where here, what we see is, James is telling us, hey, our temptation comes from your own desire. Right? And if you thought down, sat down, and thought about every sin you probably commit, it probably makes sense. You can start to think where your desires were that led you to that action. And you see the progress, right? It's a little step by step. It's like Yoda with the dark side. One thing leads to another. He says, temptation comes from desire. Desire, when it's allowed to be unchecked, gives to sin, and when sin is allowed to grow, leads to a spiritual death. Not even just a spiritual death, a death of relationships. Yep. The worst death of relationship is your relationship with God. Yep. And so, James makes this point of, don't be misled. It's one of the first things we have to be cautious with. The first step of repentance is not being misled by our own heart. 
is to understand the difference between my desires and God's desires. That takes discernment. And it takes something here in 1 Timothy 3, 2. This is made for the leaders, but I think it should be made for everyone. It says, so a church leader must be a man whose life is above reproach. He must be faithful to his wife, must exercise self-control, live wisely and have a good reputation, must enjoy having guests in his home, and he must be able to teach. But the two things I want to focus on are above reproach and self-control. And self-control, I think, is one of the most important things to have as a disciple, right? Because we saw in James, it comes from our own desires. So what does it require to repent? It requires self-control. Yeah. It requires understanding, I want to go here, God calls me here, and so I'll go there instead. I will resist what my desire is and show some self-control. Because I want to actually repent. But what above reproach means, for those who don't know, above reproach means being above skepticism. It means that you live in such a way that no one can find fault. In fact, if they wanted to find fault, they would have to make something false about you. Yeah. That's what it means to live above reproach. And you can only become above reproach when you exercise an intense amount of self-control. And so, since sin comes from our own desires, we must be careful to not be misled by them. We must exercise that self-control to live above reproach. But that can be hard. <laughs> yeah. I don't know about you, but I haven't gotten there. But Jesus makes kind of a stepping stone here, and he shows us how we can accomplish that. Again, talking to the Pharisees. He has a consistent theme with the Pharisees here. And it says in this passage, I have a little part here, and then I skip to a little later in the message, because he just kind of rails into them a bit. Um, so it says in the verse 11 part, it says, The greatest among you must be a servant, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. It says, what sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you are so careful to clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside you are filthy, full of greed and self-indulgence. There we have that self-control. You blind Pharisee, first wash the inside of the cup and the dish, and then the outside will become clean too. What sorrow awaits you, teachers of religious law, and you Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside, but filled on the inside with dead people's bones and all sorts of impurity. Outwardly you look righteous, but inwardly your hearts are filled with hypocrisy and lawlessness. Right? Again, Jesus hits that same point of this self-indulgence versus self-control. Right? He sees this issue with the Pharisees. The Pharisees had the outside part kind of going well. They did the things right. But they missed the heart. And what did Jesus say a while ago? It's from the overflow of the heart that the mouth speaks. If the heart's missing, the actions don't matter. Right? Jesus is not saying, hey, I want you to do all these things. Repentance is just, isn't just an action. It starts with the heart. But where is your heart truly at? And so he says, start with the inside. And when you truly change the heart, the actions will show it. That's what Jesus is trying to get to. It's the same thing with the tree and the fruit. He's saying, again, if you repent here first, if you truly want to make a change, then the actions will show that change. It's not change the actions to change the heart. So first you have to have that true heart of, I truly want to make a difference. And then follow through with it. But this grace among you must be a servant can also be seen here in Luke. Again, still talking to the Pharisees. It says, then Jesus told this story to some who had great confidence in their own righteousness and scorned everyone else. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee, and the other was a despised tax collector. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed this prayer. I thank you, God, that I'm not like other people, cheaters, sinners, adulterers. I'm certainly not like that tax collector. I fast twice a week, and I give a tenth of my income. But the tax collector stood at a distance and dared not even lift his eyes to heaven as he prayed. Instead, he beat his chest in sorrow, saying, Oh, God, be merciful to me, for I am a sinner. I tell you, this sinner, not the Pharisee, return home justified before God. For those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exhausted. Exalted. <laughs> they will be exhausted. I can say that. But the point being, <laughs> the point being, to live above reproach, we must clean the inside of the cup and humble ourselves to God and one another. Amen. Right? Because the reason the humility comes in is if you are not humble before God about your wrongdoing, there can be no repentance. Yeah. 
right? See the heart of this man beating his chest, eyes not even looking to God of, Lord, I am a sinner. <laughs> that is the heart. That is the stewardship we need to take before God. That is the humility, right? Because it's that humility that allows us to do something, right? But some of us sometimes, myself often, can stop there. As the beat in my chest, I'm like, God, I'm sorry. And then tomorrow I'll be doing the same thing. Because I didn't truly mean that sorry. I didn't truly want to actually change. I just wanted the forgiveness part. I just wanted yeah. to confess and move forward. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why we must actually clean the inside of the cup. Yeah. That's why there needs to be true heart change, not simple confession. Yeah. And I included one another here. Not just humble ourselves before God, because oftentimes... It's very rare that God sends you a vision in your sleep and like, this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you from you. He tends to send people. Yeah. It's quite often. You see that in the Bible too. He sent his prophets. And what did the kings do to the prophets? They killed them. They didn't want to hear it. They didn't humble themselves to one another. So with this, one of the biggest points of ministry is we must humble ourselves to one another to be able to hear when one of another is correcting you. Yes. Amen. Yesterday or two days ago, I had to humble myself to Ryan. <laughs> I had to ask Ryan, I'm like, hey, dude, what am I missing? What am I doing wrong right now? And he gave it to me, honestly, <clears throat> what I need to work on and what I need to correct. And I appreciated him for that. Because I needed to understand what were the things I needed to clean? What are the things am I missing? And so we must humble ourselves to one another. Amen. But I want to show this last passage because I've been a little stern. But I know Jesus wasn't always stern. At all times. And so in this story, in John 8, it says, Jesus returned to the Mount of Olives, but early the next morning he was back again at the temple. A crowd soon gathered, and he sat down and taught them. As he was speaking, the teachers of the religious law and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in, adult in the act of adultery. They put her in front of the crowd. Teacher, they said to Jesus, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. The law of Moses says to stone her. What do you say? They were trying to trap him into saying something they could use against him. Above reproach. But Jesus stood down and wrote in the dust with his fingers. They kept demanding an answer. So he stood up again and said, All right, but let the one who has never sinned throw the first stone. Then he stooped down again and wrote in the dust. When the accusers heard this, they slipped away one by one, beginning with the oldest, until only Jesus was left in the middle of the crowd with the woman. Then Jesus stood up again and said to the woman, Where are your accusers? Didn't even one of them condemn you? No, Lord, she said. And Jesus said, Neither do I. Go and sin no. And what I want to point out here is notice the difference in the way Jesus treated this woman versus Jesus treated the Pharisees. Mm -hmm. It's the same guy. Right. And it's the same message. The, the, the message is go and sin no more. Same idea that he's trying to tell the Pharisees, hey, we need to repent. Mm -hmm. It's the same message, but notice the tone. And this is the point, is if we humble ourselves, God is gentle. But if we harden our hearts, God is stern. And you can see that the Pharisees had gotten so hard-hearted that the only way Jesus could try to make the point clear to them was to call them a brood of snakes. Mm. But with this woman who had this humble heart before God, he was very gentle. Yeah. Neither do I. Go and sin no more. <coughs> and so my calling to you guys with repentance is don't let it stop at confession. Allow it into your heart. Allow yourself to humble yourself before God for the people around you, because when we take this humble approach to God and we allow ourselves to beat our chest and really, truly want that repentance, God is very gentle. He's a very loving parent. And he's a loving parent even when he's stern. Sometimes we need to be knocked over the head to learn that we need to repent. Yeah. And so I can tell you this, though. It is much easier to repent when you take the humble approach. When you bend the knee, you'll get the gentle, neither do I. It's when we stand firm in our righteousness, in our idea that I know everything, I have, I have the divine intervention, I know what God wants for my life. That's when God is very stern with us. So, that's my short little spiel for you guys. Uh, I hope it's a good time of self-reflection. But I ask as you go through this week, take this time to truly reflect on yourself. Have you truly been repenting? 
Or have you been comfortable? Simply confess. Amen. So with that, I'm going to pray for us, and we'll have a first come up for contribution. God, I thank you so much, Lord, that you are gentle with us if we are gentle with you, God. And so I ask that in this time, Lord, that you would help us all to just really see ourselves clearly, really see how we've been, where our heart truly lies, Lord. Let us examine the fruit of our deeds, God. Let us really, truly think about what have I been producing? What have I been showing to you, God? Am I showing you truly repentance and love, or am I showing selfishness, God? I ask that you help us to have that self-control, to truly repent and follow through, God, that we would continue to strive for you and to come closer to you, God. I thank you that in our darkest moments, you pick us up and you care for us and you love us, God, and you walk with us. It's in your name I pray. Amen. 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 Morning, church. What an amazing lesson by uh, Logan. Yeah. Definitely convicted me. I know he wasn't calling anyone out. They called me out. <laughs> but um, something that stuck out to me in there was um, where are our hearts at? And so talking with about giving, where are our hearts with giving? And I want to share a verse that we're probably all very familiar with with giving. It's in uh, Romans 12, verses, verse 13. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Very simple, very short. But what Paul's talking about in here, he's talking about love. A couple of verses uh, before this, he talks about love must be sincere. Mm. And giving is love in action. Yeah. Where are our hearts at with, with giving? Are we cheerful? Are we loving? Are we sincere with giving? Are we showing that love in giving? And so I kind of just wanted us, pretty short message of contribution, just wanted to meditate on giving and being sincere, you know, because the ultimate sacrifice, Jesus, loving, sincere, that was generous, that was giving. So yes. go ahead and pray for contribution real quick. Amen. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for today, Lord, and just an amazing lesson by, uh, by Logan, really convicted me, and I hope it convicted other people that we can just self-reflect on where our heart's at, mm -hmm. and where our heart's at with uh, generosity, too, with giving. And I pray that we can just have that generous mindset and mentality, God. We love you, Lord. It's in your name, Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Amen. Great job, Logan. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Great job, Logan. <laughs> I'm going to play this. If I can. This, this, this is from, uh, this is a couple from the Riga Church, the young couple. And uh, we just hired them from the BNMA and put uh, them on staff full time. So th uh, thanks for your contribution. It has amen. a direct impact. And they're going to share a little bit about uh, their, their campus ministry across the pond. Amen. amen. Press play here. Is the volume up, Gavin? Really high? Yeah, well, okay. Yeah. <laughs> here we go. Leo. Hello, I'm Adrian. Hi, I'm Adrian. And we're serving in the Riga campus ministry. And we would like to share with you some great news. In the last two years, our student group has grown for 2.5 times. Which is basically 12 baptisms for the last two years. And right now we have concurrent 12 Bible studies, of which four are girls and eight are men. Yeah. Of which four are Muslims, which is completely wow. unprecedented. Wow. Man. Yeah. And last year we had our first Baltic Nordic ICMC. What is amazing because it never happened before. Mm. And we were 73 participants. And for us, that's a huge amount of people because some of the churches here are at this size. So basically, we want to uh, tell you how grateful we are for all your impact in our ministry. And uh, we are very, very grateful for the BMA um, program uh, for our churches here in Baltics. Thank you very much. Yay! Yay. I share that video because I, I think there's a connection between your giving and life's changing. Amen. It's, you're, not, you're not blind to just giving. It's having yeah. an impact. It's, it's saving lives. Amen. So when you think of generosity, you think of giving, it's not just giving. It's giving because people are getting impacted to put on some, some really great young couples in the Baltic Nordics, and they're, and they're rescuing people. They're out there sharing their faith. It's awesome. Amen. Um, this is our special missions update. This is our goal is to raise $25,000. Amen. So that's where we're at right now, 6,952. Please be generous, please be sacrificial, and please give to the VMA. Amen. Um, we have a church app, but Karen's going to go ahead and take, take care of the rest of the announcements here. Yes, so we have our church app. As you know, it's been going on. 
If you have any complications, please let me know. I know some people, when they tried to, uh, they signed up for messaging and uh, some, they weren't able to see the messages. So please let me know. I'll get that taken care of and send an email in and they'll fix it right away. So uh, the church app, we don't have the live stream on the app right now, so we're still doing Zoom. We uh, need to figure out the actual camera and different things like that. Thank you for your patience. We want to get that going, but right now it's just going to take, especially with summer, people are in and out, and uh, we got to figure out what cameras will work for that. So um, we're, we'll hold off on that. So if you want to live stream or find our uh, worship service online, you got to do it on Zoom still. So uh, you can go there. And then let's see, we have our marriage retreat coming up, and we are really excited about it. Um, we're going to open registration August 1st. And what we're going to do, we're actually going to have a payment plan because we want to uh, make it easier for people to register. The cost will probably be about $120. So it'll be $60 in the month of August and then $60 uh, registration in the month of September. And the date is in October. So just take note of that, October 5th and 6th. We're looking to have a subject matter expert to speak for us in the actually can especially that's really needed in a marriage because a lot of times that we have, we don't communicate well. Yeah. So uh, it's gonna be a great time to be at um, the Renaissance Renaissance Esmeralda and what I love about how we're planning the retreat is we really want you to have time to retreat. Amen. But uh, oops didn't know he fell. Okay. Ooh. Yeah so the um we're going to have a lot of time where you can enjoy it. It's a resort that we're staying at, so to actually enjoy the resort. Enjoy like you're going away with your spouse and having a great time, not having a lot of meetings or things like that. So uh, save the date. It's going to be a great, great time together. Um, I know you wow. guys know Kelly. She got oh, engaged yeah. yesterday, and I'm uh, so excited for her. Um, uh, the brother she got engaged to is Emmerich Duenas. And he is in part of the Lifeway Church. Yeah. So she's probably out there right now, but if you could text her, encourage her, we're really excited for her, uh, for her to get engaged. And so we'll uh, find out more information. And when she's back here in service, we'll be able to hear from her mouth what, uh, how that all happened. So please encourage her nice. with yeah. that. And last but not least,